There are civilian collaborators too. Shagari, in his autobiography, beckoned to serve, suggests a wealthy Nigerian who was part of the plot that toppled his government. That Nigerian must be MKO Abiola, a friend of the military. Obasanjo's role in the coup is prominent. Shagari accused him of involving in coup baiting through his vitriolic attacks. Like Obasanjo is against Buhari, Obasanjo is in the business of attacking sitting governments. He writes letters. He delivers lectures. In a basin just letter writing hobby is what is meant the repeat of history. Ask Babangida, Abacha, Jonathan, and Buhari. Hopefully, they will tell you about a basin just letter writing prowess. In an interview he granted Point Blank News, published on the 25th of January 2008, Babangida confesses that they planned to hand power to Obasanjo when they consolidated the plot to remove Shagari, but Obasanjo declined. Anyway, he could not decline when the clique knocked on his door in 1999. When Obasanjo re-emerged with a thorny democratic skin in 1999, he made a member of the gang, Theophilus Danjuma, the Minister of Defense. By this time, Sheu Yadwa, a prominent member of the gang, had died in a bachelor's prison. Danjuma, a retired army chief of staff, was briefed of the coup to remove Shagari. This is revealed in Mustafa Jokolo's interview in the Daily Sun of September 21st, 2009. These names are key as to who gets what in Nigeria. They rule. But new centers of power are emerging as the gang lose their influence. The action of the military in government is the character of the present Nigerian state. Democracy has not succeeded in creating deep reforms as the primordial sentiment that set the country on a war path from 1967 to 1970 remains. Therefore, I am asking, is Nigeria a nation? I'll give my point of view and I will expect your reaction. The program is State Affairs. On Splash 105.5 FM, the Integrity Station. Now let's talk about building a nation. Let's look at this statement released by the network of Ninja Delta Republic fighters. It reads, it is quite unfortunate that the story has not changed till today and we are standing on that declaration. We are standing on the declaration of the sovereign state of Niger Delta and we will declare Niger Delta Republic on June 1st, 2019. The statement continues. It is a common fact that Nigeria has completely derailed from the path of peace, justice, and progress as proclaimed by its founding fathers. I just read a statement from the network of Niger Delta Republic fighters. They said they would declare a Niger Delta Republic on the 1st of June 2019. 2019 rather. Okay, this is the 28th of June, they've not declared 
But that's not the issue. Remember, I probably still making the same argument. Masob. The question of self-determination. If you come to Yoruba land now, there is a rising number of those calling for self-determination. You hear of the talk of Odudua Republic or Odua Republic as the case may be. When events like these continue to occur, a radio man will ask the question, is it the beginning of the end of the state or the road to understanding the ideal of nationhood? I want to give my opinion of the subject from a very concrete point of view. Now, I'm saying that a nation is a body of people united by a common descent and language. They may come from a number of races, but by living together, they develop certain things in common. Now, the ties that bind the people to make them a nation are psychological and spiritual. There are common feelings to live together. Do we have that common feeling here? What makes a group of people a nation is not necessarily a community of race, language, or religion. But the sentiment of common consciousness or like-mindedness. Examples are the United States of America and Switzerland. Let me tell you about Switzerland. Switzerland does not speak a common language. France and Spain have Basque population. But note that Basque is not a nation. The concept of two-nation argument led to the division of India with the Muslim-dominated Pakistan opting for independence. But now, Pakistan argued that it feared the domination of the larger Hindu tribe in one India. So at independence, Pakistan insisted on going its own way to protect its Muslim population. And it got what it wanted. And the Hindu-dominated India remains. But what happened? Religious affinity did not stop East Pakistan from breaking out in 1971 to be Bangladesh. I'm talking of what you call a somewhat monolithic religious Pakistan. But the East of Pakistan in 1971 argued for self-determination, not minding that they were Muslims. And that argument led to Bangladesh today. It can also be concluded that the power of consciousness or feeling is the definitive explanation of a nation with the acceptance of factors responsible for the sustained consciousness. It is to these factors I want to make some points on. You see, a nation is not limited to a state. We must take note of that. A nation can cut across states because there has been this argument in Africa that the colonialists so balkanized Africa that at a point, Siad Barre, the president of Somalia, wanting to go grab Somalians that were carved into Ethiopia, decided to invade the Ogaden region. Because his argument is that the all garden people are Somalians. They are not Ethiopians. So therefore, he must forcefully take them from Ethiopia and merge them with their brothers in Somalia. And that led to a big war 
that brought in the superpowers into African affairs. Today, you still have that argument about the Fulani. There's Fulani in Nigeria, there is Fulani in Ghana, there's Fulani in Guinea. Some are arguing that the Fulanis in Ghana or some of them in Mali are migrating into the forest in the southwest to build new Fulani colonies. These arguments are there. But the point I'm making is this. A nation is not limited to a state. It can cut across states. An example is the German nation. See, the German nation is in Germany. You find them in Austria. And they are also in Switzerland. The many nationalities in the Soviet Union had linguistic and cultural autonomy. Note that diversity as a mechanism of strength is real. And development is operated on the ground of individual liberty and respect for diversity. So diversity is not a limitation to building a nation. That is my argument. Now, how do you build that nation? How do you arrive at commonality? How do we accept that we are now one? There's the concept of common residence. Common ideas and ideals happen when a people live together in a common territory over a long period of time. And I believe the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Tif, the Ijo, the Hausa, the Fulani, have lived in Nigeria over a period of time. Due to territorial affinity or common residence, they come to possess common aspiration. That is what is still lacking in Nigeria. The possession of common aspiration. Because we have not possessed that common aspiration, are we a nation? For example, the United States and Canada had to possess common aspiration. I mean those who lived within the borders of the United States and Canada. They had to possess a common aspiration for them to be a nation. So today you hear of an American. I'm an American. I'm a Canadian. That is not to say there are no people within these countries that also want self-determination. And let me also talk about what happened in Poland. Remember that Poland was partitioned in the last quarter of the 18th century with Austria-Hungary and Russia in control of the Poles. Look at what I'm talking about. Poland was partitioned. It was divided. You see, once you read history, you also begin to understand the problems of Africa. That is not totally unique to Africa. In fact, I'm beginning to make the argument that there is no African exceptionalism. But what is noted clearly in my point is that something needs to be done to Africa. But I'm looking at Nigeria now. Poland was petitioned in the last quarter of the 18th century with Austria-Hungary and Russia in control of the Poles. Through immense struggle, Poland became united at the end of the First World War. The state of Yugoslavia was a union of Slavs born out of years of struggle for a country for the Slavs who existed in different European countries. You know, if you followed history, you remember the Ottoman Empire. You know, the Slavs, the Serbians were under the Ottoman Empire. Even Arabs were under the Ottoman Empire. You see, the world revolves. That is why a state is a process. I've talked about common, the commonality and how it emerges. Common race can also lead to a nation. A people will just be of one race, like Somalia. But remember that Somalia is just one race, but it did not stop Somalia from descending into a bloody civil war. And the war is still on with Al-Shabaab occupying a very large area of the country. 
It's a clan country. You have clans. They are all Muslims. They look alike. They speak the same language. But they fought a war for more than 20 years. Yes, common religion can also encourage a nation. You can argue that you can create a Fulani nation out of Nigeria if you decided that the Fulanis and the Aousas are one and they should go their way. That is common religion. It will help their cause. But that is just one way of building a nation. But my argument is on the Nigerian circumstance, the question of diversity. What common religion does is that it promotes a nationalistic sentiment. The unification of Belgium and the Netherlands at the 1815 Vienna Conference was defeated by the Catholicism spirit of Belgium and the Protestant nature of Holland. Remember, I'm talking about there was a unification of Belgium and the Netherlands at the 1815 Vienna Conference. There was Today, they are supposed to be a country or a nation, Belgium and Netherlands. But what divided them? It was the argument of Belgium saying we are Catholics and the Netherlands saying, oh, we are Protestants, so we can't cohabit. So you can see this... this they are now, it's a Christian nation, but the argument now went to the de denomination and they could not live together. Netherlands went its own way. Belgium did. That is their history. Let's look at common political aspiration because it helps to also merge people. The need to check British colonialism brought together Nigeria's different ethnic nationalities. Ignoring the differences in culture, language, and creed. Now, this is our own circumstance. That is how we came to be. A feeling of unified nationalism grew in Germany, Italy, Austria-Hungary against Napoleon Bonaparte, who had conquered their countries. The same applies to Greece, Romania, and Bulgaria against the Turks. So you can see, this struggle happened in Europe at the time. The struggle you're having in Africa. There were these tribal struggles too in Europe. There was this question of religion in Europe. So, so, so today, when people make arguments uh, as if Africa is driven by a kind of sentiment that demands its people, then one should go back and conduct history. But what happened in Europe is that they woke up and said, okay, we cannot continue like this. Let's create the kind of definitions that will build great nations. You see, a feeling of unified nationalism can grow in Nigeria. And that brings me to the question of the right of self-determination. Immediately after World War I, United States President Woodrow Wilson, in January 1918, while presenting his 14-point agenda, argued in favor of self-determination of nationalities. He states, An evidence principle runs through all the programs I have outlined. It is the principle of justice to all peoples and nationalities and their right to live on equal terms of liberty and safety with one another, whether they be strong or weak. That's Woodrow Wilson there. While addressing the United States Congress, he avers, See, why am I making reference to Woodrow Wilson? Woodrow Wilson was the United, president, United States President that launched the United States into proper global politics. At the point, United States had a policy of isolation. But Woodrow Wilson came and said it was time to build a united international team. And that was what led to the birth of the League of Nations. But sadly, America could not participate in the League because Con Congress voted against the argument of its president, Woodrow Wilson. So addressing the United States Congress, he avers, 
peoples and provinces are not to be bartered about from sovereignty to sovereignty as if they were chattels and pawns in the game. Peoples may now be dominated and governed only by their own consent. Self-determination is not a mere phrase, Woodrow Wilson continues. It is an imperative principle of action which statesmen will henceforth ignore at their peril. It was this pressure and argument from America that led to the decolonization of many African states because during the Second World War, America had become a superpower and the European powers had become weak. They've been exhausted from war and America insisted that you must decolonize parts of the world and allow countries to emerge the argument of self-determination. That was how nationalist activities in Africa got the impetus to pull out Britain, France, and the colonial teams from Africa. Now, the question of self-determination led to many other African tribes wanting to move. Biafra has his argument. The point Woodrow Wilson made is that each nationality should have a state of its own on the basis of the principle of one nation, one state. Yes, that can happen in, in some events, in some circumstance. The argument in favor of this call is that a human group with unique culture and peculiar living deserves a state to preserve and promote its identity against the blizzard of external influences. So is that what Namdekanu is saying? Is that what the self-determination groups in Yoruba land are saying? Is that what those in the Middle Belt are saying? That they deserve the right to defend their identity? But is it not possible to take from this identity, from that identity, from the other identity, and form a new identity that becomes the Nigerian identity. I stand on that argument that we can take from this identity, from the Igbo identity, the Yoruba identity, the Aosa Fulani identity, the Ijo identity, and then form the Nigerian identity, which is still lacking. And Buhari seemed not to be doing a good job in building that identity. You see, those who are called statesmen on a good day are those who build identity for nationhood. That is my definition of a statesman. So show me the statesman around and let me define him. You see, that position of identity or single identity for a single state conforms to the democratic notion of a people reserving the right of choice of leadership and statehood. In this case, self-determination is the struggle for the attainment of liberalism and democracy. It is a struggle for justice. Have you read the Ahira Declaration? The Ahira Declaration released by Biafra towards the end of the Nigerian Civil War, a classic document of what those who call for self-determination argue for. And I believe that the Ahira Declaration document can be a template for the building of the Nigerian nation. But what you see here is huge tribal sentiment that defeats the essence of nation building. Advocate of self-determination points to the conflict that exist in a state of nations as the reason for one state, one nation. But remember... Balkan from time to time revolted against the leadership of the talks. Czechs and Slovaks revolted against their domination in Austria-Hungary. Like the Biafrans revolted against the dominance of the Aousa Fulani hegemony. But listen, there is no historical justification that a mono-national state offers more stability 
than a poly national state like Nigeria. Multi-ethnic states enjoys the mixture of civilizations giving strength and currency to national objectives. That is why I stand on the ground of multi-ethnic states. Nationalism in Germany was anti-democratic because Bismarck, using brutal force, achieved the unification of Germany. The principle would lead to multiplication of states if we continue to break up. Because what is going on in Cameroon now breaks my heart. The fight for an Ambazonia state. And poor Bia is the reason why that fight continues. This fight will continue when you want to have a tribe dominating the order. That is where I will land. Those fighting for hegemonic dominance in Nigeria will not succeed. It is time to build a state where the nationalities fuse their identities for nationhood. I hope Mr. President understands. Now, small states emerge requiring the assistance of large states. That's why I don't envy small states. I like big states. I like China. I like India. You know, you are robust. You can play big in international affairs. I like the United States. I like Russia. They are big. You know, and Africa needs a big state. A big state. That giant. I don't mean the sleeping one. I mean the awakened giant. And I think that's Nigeria. So by the time you break it, break it, break it, break it, how many tribes are we talking about? I learned there are more than 250 tribes in Nigeria. Are we going to create countries for all of them? At the end of World War I, or the end of World War I led to the emergence of new states in Europe. Take note. By the end of World War II, new states began to also emerge in Africa, with wars and political instability as some of its negatives. The reason Nkrumah and others thought that the United States of Africa would help stability and development I'm still arguing that Africa is a country. Likewise, the formation of the European Union for a single market. But Donald Trump is saying America for America, defeating the essence of liberalism that America preached over the years. But I will come and address that on a good day. Nationalists who achieved statehood, take note, ended up suppressing those within the state who also demands the right of statehood on the ground of their diversity. You know, some argue that the Niger Delta betrayed the Biafran cause because the minority tribe in the Niger Delta were scared of the dominance of the Igbo tribe. Even those in Cross River and Co. complained of dominance that the Igbo majority started dominating them. So you can imagine if Biafra had worked, what would have happened today? Perhaps those in Cross River, Calabar, those in Rivers, perhaps today will be demanding for their own country too. Nationalists who achieved statehood ended up suppressing those within the state who demands the right of statehood on the ground of their diversity. For example, after the unification of Poland, the country's leaders in 1919 aggressively denied the Ruthenians and Ukrainians' right to self-determination. The nationalists in Hungary did the same to Slavs and Romanians. Sudan in Africa is another example. So my argument is that a monostate impedes internationalism and globalization. But the problems of multinational states like Nigeria can be tackled by a federal arrangement that allows the cultural diversities to find their own expression within the national interest. I rest my case. My name is Edmund Obilo. The program is State Affairs on Splash. 105.5 FM, the Integrity Station.